And now you should be seeing the first slide. Okay, so um, first of all, as you probably have seen in the um, in the program of the course, uh, or the calendar of the course actually, we have more or less four parts. The first, um, the first part will be uh, this week actually. So it will be about uh, uh, submanifolds, which is something that if you have ever done some calculus in several variables or some optimization problems or almost anything, you have already met submanifolds of the Euclidean space. So we will just be giving a bit more uh, formal context to the subject. Then we will move on uh, next week to abstract manifolds and I, I, I think there will be like five hours which will be a bit painful <laughs> about abstract manifolds, at least four hours actually, but uh, this is needed. Um, and then once we know submanif uh, man abstract manifolds, we will move on to uh, curvature geometry. And the curvature geometry is, a, I mean, is a big subject. I mean, you start talking about geodesics, uh, curvatures, uh, Laplace operator, stuff like that, Diff diffusion processes and stuff like that. And in the end, we will hopefully, I mean, I've, I've, I've written down all the calendar on the PDF file. You, you can find almost every hour as its own uh, subject. Uh, if we manage to keep the, the pace, we will end up talking about the interplay between the continuous setting, the, the, the abstract setting when everything is continuous, you have Rn and whatever, and the computational setting, the discrete setting, where you, you don't have a manifold, you just have points, you just have values, you have a finite array of uh, something, and not a continuous um, Manifold. So, this is for the uh, contents of the course. Uh, prerequisites. As I wrote online, hopefully you will only need uh, real analysis. I mean, you have to know real analysis in R and in Rn and linear algebra. Now, linear algebra is uh, huge as a subject, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure every, everything that I ascribe to a linear algebra course is in fact in your linear algebra courses, but I will be giving you some references beforehand. So I will be um, uploading on uh, Beep, um, besides the PDF of the lecture and besides the video of the lecture, the recording of the lecture, I will be uploading uh, references and uh, uh, additional material like um, I don't know uh, topics that aren't uh, um, strictly needed in the course, but that are interesting nonetheless, or um, papers that you can try and read with what we have uh, uh, done up to that point, or stuff like that. And also, uh, preparatory material, meaning, for example, if in one week we need something about linear algebra that I'm not sure you all know, I will be putting up some uh, notes or some pointers to uh, books in linear algebra and stuff like that. Finally, the last uh, non-differential geometric uh, content for today, uh, Maybe not this week because I, I don't know, there won't be much material, but uh, uh, during the course, if you want, we can 
schedule one extra hour if you want to ask questions, talk about something uh, or whatever. Obviously not in the days of the lectures, you know, not in any other day. And hopefully uh, we should try and, sh and schedule it um, in a sort of uh, uniform way. I mean, uh, not that I, I, I would try and uh, avoid that one of you asks me if we can talk on Monday and then two days later another one of you asks me if, if that he has some questions on Wednesday and so on because you are not 250 as my students in the first year but you, I mean, you're not two so it, that, <laughs> it could be dangerous. Uh, okay, that's enough. So we start. Ah, one last thing. Um, some of you are mathematicians. Uh, and, I mean, some of you are in, a, uh, in the, in the um, mathematical methods, whatever, PhD. Some of you are in other PhDs. I don't know uh, what is your background. So I don't know if, uh, I mean, how many of you uh, took a mathematics uh, undergraduate or master uh, studies. So I'm trying to balance between the various aspects of the thing. There will be theoretical lectures, there will be more applied lectures. I'm not an applied mathematician, so uh, be patient. <laughs> okay, so that's the first lecture. Um, what we will be talking about is manifolds. Manifolds uh, were introduced in uh, 1867 by Bernard Riemann in uh, his uh, habilitation lecture. So in a uh, sort of lecture you have to give in the um, German and also in the French system. Well, no, in the German system is a lecture actually. Uh, you have to give to become professor. Uh, well, so you, you can, I mean, you can find the word, this is the word um, manifold. I, I don't know if you can see the pointer of my pen, hopefully, yes. Mannigfaltic kite is manifold. Yeah. Um, and, well, okay, uh, uh, probably, I mean, you, you don't speak German, at least not obviously, so this is the translation. And you can see that the translation is by William Clifford, so it's the first translation done. William Clifford is also from the 19th century. And uh, uh, the translation was manifoldness, because manifold means a lot of stuff. <laughs> so what, is, what Riemann is saying here is that uh, if you want to talk about uh, varying quantities, uh, you have to have some, something where the quantities vary. Uh, meaning that, I mean, usually uh, you start doing that with linear spaces, vector spaces. So you, you talk about positions and the space of all positions is a vector space. If you don't have uh, um, any constraint, for example, if you, or the space of velocities, or the space of accelerations and stuff like that. Um, or many times the space is just the real line, like temperatures or stuff, or quantities like that. But for example, if you take a constrained motion, the space of all possible velocities is not a linear space. So for example, take uh, a, a motion which is uh, in, uh, bounded to stay on a circle. The space of all possible velocities is not a linear space. It, it doesn't function as a linear space. It's intrinsically different. Uh, obviously, from from this point in history, the, the, the theory developed quite a lot uh, today, but I, I, I thought it was important to uh, underline the origin of manifolds. So the idea is I have, a, I have to study a quantity which can vary in many ways, but it cannot vary in just a linear way. It cannot be the whole space, all our n, all our, our, all our vector space. It has to have some constraints. 
and I want to move on this uh, constraint set like I would in the uh, Euclidean space. So I want to talk about directions, I want to talk about velocities, accelerations, uh, distances maybe, derivatives and stuff like that. So when we start uh, thinking about uh, something like that, so when we start thinking about uh, um, having a um, subset of the Euclidean space where we can, uh, given by some conditions, uh, we have two ways of dealing with the problem, uh, the problem, the definition. So we can think of this set as a graph or as a zero. And uh, this is the same thing that you do in linear algebra, <laughs> in your freshman course in linear algebra, uh, when they make you uh, pass from the Cartesian form of a, of a subspace to the parametric form of the subspace and vice versa. This is the same thing uh, that happens to you when you study subsets of the real line in Calculus 1, in Real Analysis 1. So they ask you to um, actually write down these sets either as images or as pre-images. So the set of point X such that some function does something or the set of points which are the images of a function. So this is this this. Well, I wouldn't call it duality because we will be talking about duality, but this, this uh, twofold nature uh, is also here. So what do we mean? As a graph, it means that you take a map from one Euclidean space to the other and you construct a graph. So the uh, sets of points which are x and h of x. If N or K are one, it's the usual graph you would draw uh, in, here in the, in the drawing is uh, from R2 to R, which is maybe a bit more difficult, but not too much. As a zero, it means that you give an equation. You give the um, rel a relation between the coordinates that you want to be satisfied. So here, for example, uh, uh, well, maybe this, this drawing is not too clear because actually, but anyway, it's a weird thing in our tree. Okay. So, we, in principle, you should choose between these two approaches. Uh, but they both have uh, problems in, in some way. Well, first of all, uh, and this is, well, this is the first doubt a mathematician would have. Uh, it's, it's not just, I mean, it, it it has serious consequences sometimes also in practice when you do uh, an optimization procedure or something like that, but at first you don't notice it. So the first problem would be regularity. Uh, we were talking about graph or a zero and we, there was a function involved, like the, the function you, of, of which you take a graph or the function of which you take the zero set or, well, whatever level. Uh, usually we take uh, f equal zero, but we could take f equal 27 or 33 or whatever we want, 42. So this f, this h we are using, you could uh, ask them to be smooth, to have a number of derivatives, to be real analytic. You could ask weirder conditions like Lipschitz, like Hölder, like uh, BMO. I mean, you, the mathematicians have a lot of... Uh, classes of functions that you can have fun with or not have fun with. And the problem is that maybe this kind of definition sometimes is too vague. For example, uh, this, is a, this is a fun fact, you can try and prove it. Uh, if you give a closed set in Rn, there is a C infinity, just one C infinity function from Rn to R, so not vector value, just from Rn to R, such that the zero set is exactly that closed set. And closed set means that it contains its uh, own uh, accumulation points. So if you have a sequence of points inside 
the limit of the sequences again inside. But apart from that, it does not have to have any uh, other property. You can produce really, really, really terrible closed sets. Um, yes. I mean, you, you can look up examples online. Um, and so with the definition of the zero set, usually one imagines a nice equation like uh, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal one, so it's a sphere, but actually you can find almost anything you want. On the other side, to restrict it, a graph is something that, uh, I mean, if we take, um, where was it? If we take, uh, our graph here, above each point on the base, you have just one point of the graph. So uh, maybe it's restricted. The sphere does not respect that. You cannot, uh, I mean, this is some stupid thing, but if you take a sphere, And you take, well, it's symmetric. So any any possible plane, and you try and project the sphere on the plane, you will always have. For, for I mean, for some points you won't have any pre images. So if you take a point here, you won't have any pre image on the sphere. If you take some points, you will have one because you get a tangent line, maybe here. But for most of the points, you will meet the sphere in two points. So this is not a graph on any possible two plane. And why I'm choosing a plane? Because the sphere is something which should be two dimensional. So, uh, not a graph. In homage to, in homage to Riemann, one should notice that what's the problem here? That you have your equation, which is, for example, this one. And, well, it doesn't matter what plane you pick because the sphere is, I mean, you can rotate the sphere. So you can always assume that your plane is the um, Z equal uh, something plane. So you want to uh, explicitate Z and Z will be, well, you would write something like that, right? You write something like that, and that's in, in fact the, the, this phenomenon that you can you have to pick one of the two determinations of the square root. Riemann studied the same kind of thing only on complex numbers and introduced the Riemann surfaces, which I mean have his name exactly because of this. And Riemann surfaces started from this 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 kind of, of problem. Well, anyway, it's not what we are uh, talking about here. And the last kind of problem is global or local, meaning uh, a sphere is locally a graph, but not globally a graph. Uh, does the same happen on zero sets? Can we have a global definition? I mean, what is the problem? Is that, think about uh, coding something which has only a local definition. So when you have to define it, you have to define it piecewise and glue up the pieces. If you want to store this kind of information in any data structure, it's a, it's a big problem. I mean, it's, it's not clear how to do that. It, it, it should be really, really, really 
a dynamical kind of data structure, which is very hard to uh, work with. So, also, when you're writing like an optimization program, you have to uh, travel through your set. If your set is defined only locally, you have to change piece the piece of your set where you are at every moment of time, probably. And this is this obviously makes the algorithm much uh, more complicated and uh, uh, expensive in terms of uh, uh, time. And then, okay, we have two approaches. It would be f really nice if they were equivalent. Uh, yes, I am recording uh, locally, not with WebEx. So we're trying this, this, this one, uh, this first hour, and then we see the results. Um, okay. The equivalence. The equivalence comes from your linear algebra course, uh, at least the idea. <laughs> In linear algebra, the equivalence between the parametric and the Cartesian description of the subspace is uh, practically obtained uh, by performing a Gaussian elimination. Uh, you, um, you probably, I mean, in either direction. I mean, if you have the parametric version, you do the right Gaussian elimination and you get your Cartesian equations. If you have your Cartesian equations, you just have to solve the linear system. So it's, again, Gauss method. Here, we are not in a linear uh, situation, but we may think of performing a nonlinear, a smoothly varying Gaussian elimination on the Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix is the matrix of first derivatives or the function f, I mean, uh, I'm using capital F here, which is the function which describes our manifold as a zero locus. So f is from Rn to our n minus k, and uh, f equals zero is our uh, set. This is not exactly a, a proof, but if you have the last k columns of the uh, Jacobian matrix, which are linearly independent, for example, we can somehow uh, express the uh, associated variables, the last k variables, in terms of the remaining ones. The problem is that this works exactly on a point where we forget about the smooth function. We have just a matrix and we do the really the Gauss, the Gauss algorithm, the Gaussian elimination. It can be, I mean, it's like like Taylor polynomial. Taylor polynomial is exact in one point. It's more or less exact nearby, but if you travel far enough, it's just completely wrong. And this is the same. You do something which is exact on one point, which is more or less what you are looking for around the point, and just degenerates if you are too far away, in principle. So, the exact theorem is this one. Uh, can you read it on your screens? Maybe not. So let's see if I can. Oh, blah. Now you can read it probably. Uh, it's, it's written in a weird way. Uh, I think it's from principle of ma Principles of Mathematical Analysis by Walter Rudin. I mean, it, the, the, the screenshot. What is the idea? You have a map F from an open set of R n plus m to R n. And you want to study its zero set. So you're going to from R n plus m to R n, so you are imposing n conditions, you are expecting m degrees of freedom. So something which depends on m parameters. You want to find the parameterization. So A is the Jacobian matrix. It's the matrix of first derivatives of f. And uh, you assume that A of x, x are the first n coordinates, is invertible. 
So the, the first part of the matrix is inverted. I mean, this is a rectangular matrix which is longer than its high, and you take the biggest square that fits at point in the left. If this is true, you can find an open set, a ball, in your ambient space, and another ball in Rm, which is a parameter space, such that you can write your zero set as a graph on W, the open set in the parameter space, around B in W, so you're around the point A, B that you started with. So, in fact, you have a function G from W to Rn, so from the space of parameters to Rn, such that the graph of G is your zero locus. And well, you have a, I mean, you have a relation on the, the, the Jacobian matrices. So this should be a very famous theorem, at least uh, in the old course of uh, real analysis too at mathematics. It was uh, one of the milestones. It's an implicit function theorem, or in Italy one of the theorems of Dini, just in Italy. But this is exactly what we want, because it's something that makes it possible to pass from a zero to a graph. What's the condition? The condition is Ax is invertible. Uh, I mean, these are, you have a matrix which has uh, n plus m columns and n uh, rows, so you are assuming that the first n times n matrix you can find is uh, invertible. So you have your um, Jacobian matrix, and we are actually assuming that. So this is. n plus n, this is n, and we are assuming that we have here a square matrix and uh, Ay is the, is, this the second part, is what, this is what is called, ah, okay, this was A in the Okay. Well, it's not uh, working, but it's not a problem. This was A. This was AX. And AY is another minor inside the, uh, the matrix. So it, it, it actually depends on how. how uh, on how, what are um, n and n. So maybe the easiest uh, would be to first uh, uh, try the hypersurface case, so you, have one, you only have one equation and you work it out how, how it becomes. So we are supposing that this matrix is invertible, but it it doesn't, it doesn't matter that these are exactly the first uh, uh, n columns. It can be any n columns. You, you can just reorder the coordinates, obviously. The point is that this matrix, which is the matrix of first derivatives, has to have full rank. So you're just asking that this determinant is different from zero. So um, have to change of coordinates. 
you are asking that the rank of A is equal to N, full rank. And if you think again about linear algebra, what you're saying, I mean, what, what, what does it mean for rank? It means that you are using the exact number of equations to describe your set. You want to describe something which, is, which has the dimension two in R3, you use one equation. You want to describe something which has dimension two in R5, use three equations, and so on. This is always possible with the, um, linear subspaces, uh, with the rest is not so clear. Yeah, anyway, ay is referred to the y variable inside here. And it should be exactly the, the, the missing part of the matrix. So the second block of the matrix. Okay, now we are ready, formal definition. A subset M in Rn is a smooth k-dimensional embedded submanifold of Rn if it's locally a zero set. So if for every P in M there exists an open neighbor U over N of P, obviously, and the smooth function F from U to R N minus K, N is the ambient dimension. K is the submanifold is the submanifold dimension. Here. Uh, such that P is in U, obviously, is the neighborhood of P, and locally, so inside this open ball, every time I say open neighborhood or something like that, you usually can think ball. So the points near enough, close enough to P. So the intersection of M with this ball is the zero set of F and the Jacobian matrix of F at every point of the ball, not only of M of the ball, has rank N minus K, which is the maximum rank. So, this picture. Here we have R2, we have our uh, set, which is a curve, I mean, you, you would call it a curve, what we are saying, we are saying that there is, for every point P, I mean, it's not very clear that this is a P, but this doesn't work as well. But anyway, for, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's not uh, <laughs> 4K, <laughs> anyway. For every point P, you find a neighborhood, so a ball, U, and on this ball, a function f, which goes from r2 to r, because you want it to be one dimension. So f sends the green part and the green part, the red part and the red part, and the orange part and the orange part. So it sends the part of m which intersects u on 0, this side on this part, and this side on this part. I keep saying this, but you, you can confirm that you see the pointer, hopefully. Well, I hope so. What's our request? That in this case the gradient of f, because it goes from r2 to r, so just the gradient, is different from 0, not only on m, but on all of our neighborhood u. So if I, I have to do this. Now you see it, probably, hopefully. Yeah. OK, so the red part goes to the red part. The green part goes to the green part. There are colors. I mean, unless you're also colorblind. Uh, and the orange part goes to 0. What we are asking for is that the gradient of f is different from 0, not only on our set, but on a whole neighborhood. This is delicate and important. Okay, so what are the important features of these definitions? Smoothness, so we're a smooth k-dimensional embedded sum manifold, smooth function. And you can give to smooth the meaning you want. So we can talk about C1 smooth manifolds if the function is C1, 
see k smooth manifolds, you can talk, usually you will talk about c infinity smooth manifolds, so function will have all the derivatives we want. You can talk about real analytic submanifolds, if the function is real analytic. And, uh, well, this is a bit uh, complicated. And you can talk, you, you can lessen the regularity. So you can ask for something like Lipschitz, if you know what it is, Holder, uh, Sobolev. If you go lower and lower in regularity, you have problems with the equivalence theorem we were talking about before, okay? Because the theorem before was for the smooth case. Okay. Uh, so the smoothness, it's local because for uh, for every point we want is in principle small neighborhood u. Okay, this this is a spoiler, but submersion, submersion is this condition. Well, no, the, the only the second part. Okay, that the Jacobian metric is full rank. And then by the equivalence result we were talking about before, by the implicit function theorem, we have that this definition gives a set which is locally a graph, because we can locally parameterize it. Being a graph is being parameterized by something, it's the same kind of thing. In linear algebra, it's easier to think about parameterization. Uh, for, well, calculus, it's easier to, to think about a graph, but actually when you do something, what you, when you perform a, an operation, like an optimization procedure or something like that, you're actually using the parameterization, not the graph structure, the parameterization structure. I mean, you probably all have seen in uh, calculus 2, in several real variables, the, when you want to uh, find the area of a graph, you have to find the parameterization, then calculate some weird stuff, and then integrate it. Okay. That's the same kind of uh, um, uh, procedure that we'll uh, end up doing over and over uh, when you uh, deal with manifolds in a naive way. Okay. Now, well, th this list of examples is not really exhaustive and not so interesting, maybe. I will put some more elaborate stuff on uh, the supplementary material I was talking before, hopefully. Now, affine subspaces. Take Rn, take any hyperplane, plane, three plane, k plane, whatever, wherever you want. It's a submanifold. It's not that hard to show it. Mm -hmm because any affine subspace is a zero locus of a uh, affine function. So, and affine functions, the, the um, okay, uh, you have f from Rn uh, to Rn minus k given by f equal ax plus b with b in r n minus k and a is a matrix uh, and let's get that n. The differential of f at any point is constantly a. So if you have uh, the uh, right <laughs> matrix, the, the full rank matrix, any level set of this F is, uh, 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 is an embedded sum benefit. Spheres. Okay, well, just for the fun of it, The unit sphere inside of Rn is given by just the vectors of Rn such that 
the transpose trying x times x is equal to 1. And so that's your plan. This is your defining function. And uh, it's not difficult to see that the gradient of this function um, because this is a this is a function from R n to R it's not difficult to compute the gradient okay at any point is just uh, a multiple of x So the only problem here would be in the origin, but the origin is far away from our set. So you see, we, you cannot find a function on the whole of Rn which has the right gradient. We, but we can find a function which has the right gradient near our zero set, our manifold. Okay, the orthogonal group, which seems a more complicated thing, but it's a sphere more or less because what's the orthogonal group? The orthogonal group is the set of matrices square matrices such that the transpose is the inverse and I think you can see it's very, very similar to a sphere. So as an exercise, you could try and calculate the f, where f is um, this function. Spatial linear group, OK, the determinant equal to 1. Uh, the determinant is mode function and whatever. Now, known examples, x is axes are not, I mean, the union of the two axes in uh, R3, R4, R2, 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 whatever, is not a manifold. It's an embedded submanifold. Why? Well, the problem is where the axes intersect. You cannot find something which has the right uh, uh, rank of the Jacobian where the two axes intersect. A cusp, which is something like this, Again, you have here a problem with the gradient. If you want, uh, you, you, you can take this graph, for example. This is a zero set, but this function here is the origin, and this function has a vanishing gradient in the origin. Tangent circles or any other kind of stuff like that. So just to draw a picture. Something like this. Again. Here is the problem. Now, a couple of curiosities. Uh,
you can have I mean things that you would like to call submanifolds but uh, uh, I mean for example these show you these two well they're not counterexamples because I'm not giving you the right the, the actual examples but there are sub manifolds embedded and whatever uh, such that you can only find your function for which there is zero set locally and not all around the sub manifold and there are sub manifolds where you can find this function around the submanifold, but this function cannot extend in any way to the whole of Rn. So not, not even like the sphere and where the gradient goes to zero and you have ah, no, what whatever the gradient is, you cannot extend the function totally outside the, the, the small neighborhood of your, of your neighborhood. Is there, I mean, the first one is not so difficult, the second one is quite a difficult example. But anyway, so you really need all this local uh, structure we are giving. Now the last thing about, uh, uh, I mean, the last part of definition probably, smooth maps. So if we have Rn and Rk, you all know what a C infinity a smooth map is. So we take a k-dimensional manifold and an h-dimensional manifold, one in Rn, one in Rm, a function from the first subset of Rn to the second subset of Rm is smooth at the degree you want if you can extend it outside as a smooth function. So if in principle your function is defined only on a small uh, part of M if you can extend it outside of M, in the whole of the ambient space, at least nearby, such that it becomes smooth in the usual coordinates of our N, then it's a smooth function. A diffeomorphism is a bijective function such that both F and its inverse are smooth. Examples, well, here I'm giving you some examples, so I mean they're not really, mm, for, for example, this, this one is, a, um, well, it's not different, because it's from the ball in R3 to the group of rotations of R3. Uh, this is a different, reason, which is, in, well, anyway, this is from the sphere to the symmetric matrices, and this is from the torus, S1 times S1, to the sphere. But anyway, I mean, uh, actually, I don't really want to delve into these um, maps right now. For the maps, uh, you don't have all the problems as for the defining functions. So a smooth map is defined locally, so for every point there is a neighborhood where we can extend a function to a function which is usually smooth in the coordinates of Rn. But this actually holds if and only if it holds all around your manifold. For example, a function from, from the sphere to the sphere is smooth only if it's smooth all around the sphere in a small uh, neighborhood. The last uh, bit of information on submanifolds. The inverse and the implicit function theorems has, have this consequence, which is not really famous. So it, well, it's a wall of text, but what does it say? It says that you can locally linearize your function. H is a change of coordinates. F is any function. And here is saying that you can locally write F up to a change of coordinate as a um, matrix, so a linear function, plus an error term. And this error term is, uh, um, is a mapping from the image of your matrix into the, uh, well, 
or Togo and Arthur Lee. Anyway, so it's an error term. It's something you can uh, avoid considering at, if, at first, at least. So what's important for us that the equation f of a equals zero becomes uh, uh, this equation equals zero, but the function phi we're using here is particular, so this vanishes if and only if this vanishes. Sorry, you're right. This vanishes if and only if this vanishes because of the nature of phi, of how it's defined phi. So you end up with an equation which is a of something equal, equal to zero. So your set f equal to zero is locally the image through a change of coordinates of a kernel of a matrix, so a linear space. So this is the last uh, uh, piece of information. We can use it to give another characterization of some manifolds. If something is a submanifold, a k-dimensional embedded submanifold, if and only if for every point there is a small neighborhood, a small ball, where he looks like a linear subspace. So here you have your uh, uh, your manifold M or curvy. You have your point, the orange point. You find a small ball U and the intersection, which is this curved blue thing. If there is a change of coordinates, h, which linearizes locally your set, then it is a k-dimensional submanifold, where k is the dimension of the linear subspace. So and this gives you the local structure of a submanifold. For every neighborhood, for every point, you, you find a small neighborhood, and the map to our k which is a diffeomorphism between the small parts of the manifold and our k, so it gives you local coordinates. So it gives you a way to put coordinates on a submanifold. And the, the final point of all this stuff is that if you have a map from a manifold to another manifold, so here we have f. When is it smooth? Every time you take the coordinates of the first and the coordinates of the second, you can bring down the map with this composition. And this f is smooth if and only if every time you go down in coordinates, the resulting map in coordinates is smooth. Smooth in the usual sense. Now this is a map, for example, from R2 to R2. Okay, so this is enough for the first uh, uh, hour. Do you have any questions? If not, I will stop the recording and uh, take a little break to just save the files and everything.